Before I, pre before I begin, I'd like to state that our organization is nonpartisan, but I'm aware of my audience right now, so I'm going to be gearing it towards you. <laughs> Centuries ago, some people that have long since died have decide, uh, decided on our voting method. Uh, we call this plurality. And despite advances in mathematics and political science, we've been obedient to this method virtually entirely without questioning it. And uh, it, it's become so pervasive that when we think about what it means to be voting, we tend to confuse voting itself with plurality voting, our vote for one method. And so that's sort of the degree that we're talking about. So what I want you to start thinking about is, should we be questioning our obedience to this vote for one plurality voting method? And should we be concerned with alternative methods? So to begin, I want you to understand what I mean when I say a voting method. Uh, when I say that, I mean when voters give an expression of their opinion on a slate of candidates, and that information is translated to select a winner or winners. And right now, I'm going to be focusing on voting methods that select only one winner. Um, and what does it mean to be a, a good voting method? A good voting method is one that gives an accurate re reflection of support for all those candidates and selects the candidate that best represents the electorate. Now, it's sort of the beginning here with the expression uh, with voting. Now, with plurality voting, we're told to select one candidate. That's it. And if you're brazen enough to choose more than one candidate, then they throw your ballot away. So I want you to think for a moment. Is there any way to offer less information than choosing one candidate? Really think about this. Can you give any less information than that. I, I've thought about this for years, and I haven't been able to come up with anything. So I find it bizarre that when we offer so little information and we put our ballot in the ballot box, we expect something magical to happen. We expect our voting method to spit out a result that represents us. And yet we're dismayed when it doesn't happen. The mere fact that we go through the motions of democracy is not good enough. That's, that's a fantasy. So I want you to think about what if we did other things the same way that we did voting, the same way that we approached uh, voting with priority, our vote for one method. So imagine a scenario where you have a loved one that's missing. And so you go down to the police station to file your missing persons report. And they lead you down the hall, and they introduce you to a sketch artist. And the sketch artist, you greet them, and they say, I want you to tell me the best feature about your loved one. And in this, in this case, we'll say, it's, we'll say it's your wife. And you say, my, my wife, she has this beautiful mouth. She has these deep red lips, and when she's laughing, she bites her tongue in this way. It's, it's, it's amazing. And you start to go on. But before you get far, the, the, the sketch artist, he stops you. He, put, he puts his hand out and says, that'll be enough. <laughs> now, given the information that you provided, how good of a sketch do you think this person is going to come up with? you have a pair of floating lips. He's going to be sending a search party out for the Rolling Stones logo. He's not going to find your wife. And bizarrely, we, we do the same approach when we vote. We offer so little information and we expect this amazing result to come out. And, and we get surprised when it doesn't happen. But we don't have to do it this way. There are alternative methods. We have methods that allow you to approve of all the candidates that you like. You can rank candidates. You can score candidates. So imagine going back to this scenario uh, where you filed your missing persons report and you go down to the sketch artist. 
And we'll have this sketch artist embody these alternative methods. And we'll say that the police department has since fired that previous sketch artist. So the sketch artist would ask, okay, well, tell me all the features about your wife that you find pleasant. Well, you can start with her mouth, but you can go on. You can talk about how her dark hair goes past her shoulders, her cheekbones, her eyelashes, and the sketch artist might ask you to rank the features. And so you talk about how you love her mouth the most, how she has these really sparkling eyes and you like them second. You get, the sketch artist could ask you to score all the features about your wife. And here you can get really in depth. You, your wife may not like you doing this, by the way, but what you come up with is a detailed assessment of what she looks like. You're going to get a picture of, of what resembles to be your wife, and the search party is going to have a much better chance finding her this way than looking for that Rolling Stones logo. And when, when we offer expression this way with alternative voting methods, unsurprisingly, we get better results. And that's a large portion because we offer information, much more information than we do under plurality. Now, there are other ways that plurality distorts our electoral process other than choosing poor outcomes. Uh, plurality is also responsible for having people marginalize and exclude candidates. So I want you to go back to a familiar election in 2000. This is when Nader ran. And Nader, he, uh, he wasn't in the debates, and that's not uh, unlike many other, many other elections. Now, with, with Nader, he, he didn't have a lot of support, but some people, uh, they, they did support him. And among those people uh, was Michael Moore. So in 2000, uh, Ralph Nader, he sold out Madison Square Garden, and he's with about 10,000 seats. So that's, that's pretty impressive. And Michael Moore was there sort of cheering on Nader. But so as, as he was cheering on Nader, um, that, that support continued. But then Florida happened. And in Florida, we saw the vote splitting problem. And so after that, uh, the, the support for Nader dwindled, and it especially dwindled in 2004 when he ran again. Because then what happened was that Michael Moore, he completely changed his tune. And this is someone that is com very aligned with the ideals that, that Nader supports. So this should be really surprising for us. I mean, from 2000 to 2004, Michael Moore didn't do a 180 as far as what his ideology was. He didn't change his opinion about taxes. He didn't change his opinion about health care. He didn't change his opinion about foreign policy. And, I, and I'm not here to depict Michael Moore in a negative light. We shouldn't blame him. What we should be blaming here is plurality voting. Now, Imagine if we could take Michael Moore back in time to 2004, but have him use approval voting. Well, what would have happened then? What would his tune have been? Well, in 2004, if he was using approval voting, well, he, he likely would have said, you should vote for Kerry to avoid Bush winning. But if we're using approval voting, you can keep going. You can choose as many candidates as you want with approval voting. So, uh, presumably, he actually liked Nader in 2004. He just didn't want Bush to win. So he would have said, go ahead and vote for Nader. And he would have done it just as enthusiastically as he had done in 2000. Now, the, the, the fact that we, we have a voting method that has someone that is completely aligned with the candidate, and yet, have them campaign against that candidate, I can't imagine a situation that's more appalling. Now with, with approval voting, uh, if, if this were to be used, uh, now we use 
polling a lot to protect support for candidates. And that's often the way that debates, it, debate forms debate <coughs> used to decide who gets in and who doesn't. So if you're using approval voting, then they're going to get a much more accurate reflection of support. And so not just Nader, but all these other voices are going to be able to come into play. You can't exclude or marginalize people that are getting 20, 30, 40 percent in polls, which they can do under approval voting. And what that means is you get much more competition, you get much more, many more ideas in play. Competition is what democracy thrives on. And so you can imagine that alternative voting it is really the, the miracle grow for democracy. Plurality voting would be, I, I, I don't know what plurality voting would be, maybe, maybe roundup. <laughs> and uh, within the last year, I moved from Michigan to D.C. And Michigan it was a, it's a lot like a lot of other places in that uh, they, they don't do a very good job at electing independents and third parties. Uh, in fact, I, I looked it up. Uh, the last person to be elected governor in Michigan was James Gordon. James Gordon was elected back in 1841. And, and it really shouldn't even count because James Gordon was from the Whig Party. And unsurprisingly, we've been using uh, plurality voting this whole time. Now, something else interesting is that 1841, that's also about the time that the telegraph was invented. So that's, that's the context, that's the extent that we're out of date on this voting method. So when I say plurality voting is an out of date voting method, this is the degree that I'm talking about. If you saw someone and they were using a telegraph machine, you would say, hey, we have smartphones now. <laughs> and yet, we, we don't think twice when we walk into the voting booth and we're using this antiquated plurality voting method. If we saw someone and they were walking down the street with the Walkman, we would say, we have iPads and MP3 players now. And yet, we don't think twice when we use plurality voting. If, if, if we were at a friend's house and they said, I need to check my messages, hold on a little bit. And they go to their answering machine with the cassette tape and they go through their messages, you would tell them, we have voicemail now. You don't have to use that. And yet, we don't think twice when we use plurality voting. Now, we don't have to do this. I mean, we have other choices here. And like I mentioned with approval voting, they don't have to be difficult. Approval voting, you're just choosing as many candidates as you want, no so it's wins. The only rule you're changing is that your ballot doesn't get it thrown away <coughs> when you choose other people. This, is, this isn't complicated. So we, we don't use a telegraph anymore. We don't use Walkman, and we don't use answering machines that run on cassette tapes. And we shouldn't be using an out-of-date priority voting method. It's out-of-date. We need to move on. Now, not everyone, I'm sure, thinks that we need to move on with something besides priority voting. I'm sure that there are people that love the fact that you can't express yourselves when you vote. I'm sure that there are people that love the fact that certain candidates and ideas are marginalized and excluded. And I'm sure that there are people that love the fact that we're using a centuries-old voting method. And it's no accident that our last president of the United States to be an independent was George Washington. <laughs> now, if you don't like those features about plurality voting, then you're going to start to need to care about alternative voting methods. A lot. This needs to be your issue. Because without alternative voting methods, you're not going anywhere. And um, I also have uh, uh, a video as well on approval voting. Uh, so just to, to give you an example of uh, just how simple this is.